Hi and welcome. You are listening to The Philosophists, a pair of software guys, but we won't be doing that all our lives. No, instead of serving up silicon-based solutions for a living, we plan to serve the great cause of philosophy. But until the idea of mortgage debt is abolished, we will be more modest in our ambitions. However, today we will talk about abolishing something very significant. Suffering. That is because we will be talking to David Pierce, the renowned transhumanist, author of The Hedonistic Imperative, and co-founder of Humanity Plus, who has a vision that sees suffering abolished in all sentient life. In its place, David sees biotechnological advances replacing suffering with information-sensitive gradients of bliss. In short, we are talking about a biohappiness revolution. This will be an introductory episode, and as such, we'll focus on introducing David's abolitionist project for suffering. It won't dive into detail on David's thoughts on more futuristic transhumanist possibilities, or his thoughts on the suffering of non-human animals and the biosphere. These will be kept in the locker for future conversations and will only be mentioned in passing today. So in this episode, you will hear us talking about hedonic set points, the hedonic treadmill, and how they relate to our suffering, the lottery paradox as it applies to psychological well-being, the problems associated with existing drug-based treatments for pain and the promises of gene therapy, the role of certain genes such as SCN9A in the experience of pain and suffering, hyperthymic people and the role of the FA and FA-out genes, pre-implantation genetic screening and CRISPR, happier babies and whether suffering should be opt-in or opt-out, and holding genetic engineering to account and the sanctity of life. We'll also contrast software and software engineering techniques to genetic engineering, and there is a small epilogue at the end with some clarifications. One clarification I will note in advance, however, is my confusing of the words anaesthetic and anesthesia, but I'm sure you will get the gist of what I'm trying to say when the befuddlement strikes. So plenty to get through then. For me, it was a wonderful and mind-blowing conversation, and I hope it lands somewhere similar for you. The conversation itself was recorded the day after Christmas, and there have been a few reasons for its delay. One is that this episode tips over the hour mark into long play territory, so we've put a little extra effort into adding chapter markers, which can help you if you are a time-starved listener. You can move around the list of chapters in the online player on our website at thephilosophists.com, Also, your podcast app or offline audio player may support chapters, so we hope you find these useful. Uh, If you do, let us know. Anyway, my name is Declan McGrath, hoping to minimise suffering for anyone listening to this, and his name is still Simon Robertson, but he is sitting out today's episode, no doubt in the depths of infinite bliss with his canine non-human animal friends. Okay, let's get philosophistical. Hello, David. How's it going? Hello, Declan. It's very good to see you. And let me just hide myself for you. It's been a, a while coming. We've we've had a few offline, online, but never in call or in person conversation. Well, in, in, indeed. And I'm always mildly disconcerted when things actually work as it appears to now. Without further ado, will we, will we bring ourselves to the, the philosophical subjects of biohappiness and, and things like that? Just David, before we before we jump into the the subject matter itself, I presume you don't want to position yourself too much as the subject. You'd, you'd rather talk about your content, but I think it would be it would be great if you you kind of brought us a little bit of history on your your intellectual coming out from from the beginning <laughs> and uh, <laughs> how how you came to be so involved in in the, the abolishing of suffering and transhumanist movements. Oh, good heavens. Well, potted life histories tend to be very, very selective, and it's often what people leave out is uh, most revealing. I'm a third generation vegetarian, both sides of the family, all four grandparents, three of my eight great grandparents, quite uh, religious, Quaker influences, uh, more exotic influences to my. My paternal grandmother was uh, an anthroposophist, a devotee of Rudolf Steiner. She converted from Zoroastrianism in 1930, I believe. So although some of my views are a little eccentric, one could say that there are precedents there. 
But no, very religious, very morally upstanding family. I'm not religious. I ceased to believe in God around about the age of uh, 10 or 11. And since then have been a, a secular scientific rationalist always been preoccupied by the problem of suffering, not just in humans, but in non-human animals too. And yeah, I was a a very introspective child. I used to rock to music in a darkened room with my eyes closed, just thinking about the nature of reality. But yeah, skipping skipping a lot. Uh, Back in 1995, I wrote an online manifesto, The Hedonistic Imperative. I used to assume that my views were unpublishable, but then came the internet, or more particularly the World Wide Web. Uh, The hedonistic imperative essentially argues that we should phase out the biology of suffering and use biotechnology to create a a novel architecture of mind, life based entirely on information sensitive gradients of well-being and eventually superhuman bliss. Uh, We can unpack that later in the podcast, if you like. But yeah, given we're on potted life history, histories, yeah, back uh, then in 1997, the young postgrad at the London School of Economics, Nick Bostrom, uh, stumbled across the manifesto, got in touch. Uh, We set up the World Transhumanist Association, now rebranded Humanity Plus. Uh, Transhumanists essentially believe in using technology to overcome our biological limitations. And although my focus has always been on the problem of suffering and technical fixes, there's far more to transhumanism than a kind of biohappiness revolution. Transhumanism embraces the idea of radical life extension, maybe some form of quasi-immortality eventually, and also radical intelligence amplification. There are many different conceptions of, of super intelligence. But yeah, if one wants to sum up what transhumanism is about, I, I normally say the three supers uh, uh, super happiness, super longevity, and super intelligence. As you said, there's, there's a phenomenal amount to unpack in there across all the, the descriptions and terms. And uh, it's, I think it's brought everything relevant into play nicely. I think maybe it's, it's almost like a journey arc. At phase one is what can we do to minimize and eradicate uh, suffering? That's probably phases one and two, two being the eradication, and then pushing on from there, maybe phases three, four, dot, dot, dot in um, would be the moving towards the, the, the transhumanist side of things, the, the three supers of, of intelligence. And gosh, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you enumerate them as we, as we go on. <laughs> may, may, maybe a great place to start is just like it does sound remarkably ambitious to abolish suffering. Um, what would you say to to someone that says, let's t- put on Sky News and let's let's look at the day's issues or whatever your news of choice is? It may, may vary very dramatically. But what would you say to someone that says, well, let, let's let's get taxes up or down or whatever direction <laughs> they want to put them in and, and try and build something from there? Well, how do we go? Through? Well, I'm glad you didn't say Fox News. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think. Mean, Clearly, the idea of phasing out suffering, yeah, it is insanely ambitious in one sense. It's not new. I mean, to the best of our knowledge, you know, Gautama, Buddha, 2,500 years ago, no wag in the audience says, said, hey, Gautama, Buddha, isn't that a bit ambitious, abolishing suffering? It is not a five-year plan or even a 50-year plan. Um, But what has changed is information technology and in particular biotechnology. Uh, Back 2,500 years ago, Gautama Buddha couldn't have envisaged recalibrating the hedonic treadmill. That's our suite of negative feedback mechanisms that stop most of us being very happy or very sad for long. Uh, Back 2,500 years ago, Gautama Buddha couldn't have envisaged something like cultured meat and animal products, uh, uh, i.e. essentially meat, animal products that are produced without the horrors of factory farming. Nor could uh, Gautama Buddha have envisaged uh, reprogramming the global ecosystem, which is the kind of thing that's going to be possible 
uh, next century and and beyond. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can understand someone who, who's, whose reaction to hearing all this uh, stuff is this is utopian uh, dreaming, but one can actually spell out in a fair degree of detail precisely what getting rid of suffering entails. And that is one reason for going into quite specific details right down to the level of particular genes and alleles to show that this is this is real science. This isn't sci-fi. I mean, there's a kind of optimal level of detail one, what, 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 what one can go into. Um, but uh, it's also worth recalling, too, that the World Health Organization uh, has as its founding constitution recently reaffirmed a definition of health that is, if anything, even more insanely ambitious than the transhumanist conception of health. I, uh, the WHO defines health as a state of complete physical, social, emotional well-being, whereas transhumanists would argue for life based on information sensitive gradients of well-being. Uh, the uh, the World Health uh, Organization goes one step further: complete well-being. I mean, by by that definition of health, no no human in history has yet been healthy. It's insanely ambitious. Now, one could say, ah, but well, they can't really mean what they say. But it's there in in black and white, and I think it's our responsibility to urge the World Health Organization to live up to its responsibilities. I guess the, the thing is, wh why not be that ambitious? Uh, you, you know, why should we why should we aim for slightly miserable as as the, the gold stage for everyone? I've seen I've seen talks before. I can't remember TED Talks or something like that, where, where the speaker was talking about envisaging the, the planet as a as a Petri dish. And we're, we're we're pushing up against the edges, just multiplying outwards and, and resources are dwindling and that there is talk of, of hopping on rockets and flying off the Petri dish to far-flung Petri dishes. But um, there, there seems to be a lot to be said for optimizing the, the Petri dish we're in. Certainly kind of health and well-being, psychological state seems to be core to that. <laughs> Let, let's uh, get rid of suffering uh, on Earth before radiating beyond the solar system, at least. Um, yeah. <laughs> We don't envisage the, the, the David Pierce uh, space tourism enterprise happening just yet. Well, not unless I sell my accumulated stash of Bitcoin. No, I, I have <laughs> a large accumulated stash of, of, of Bitcoin. But no, I, 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 I honestly, I, I do not think we should be spending resources uh, that could be used in helping sentient beings uh, on Earth in space tourism and the like. It, it seems morally frivolous. Yeah. If we look at the a kind of a conversation around well-being, especially psychological well-being, uh, you know, I think you've brought in the, the concept of, of a hedonic treadmill or hedonic set points, or at least you've discussed that. You've been you've been very much a proponent of that. Would you like to say something about just what is hedonic set points and and how do we all get tangled up in the, the web of that? Yeah, I mean, the most the most vivid way to convey the nature of the hedonic treadmill, and the hedonic set points is the so-called lottery paradox. A famous study uh, reported that six months after either winning the lottery or becoming quadriplegic in a terrible accident, most people will have reverted to their approximate level of well-being or ill-being before the great uh, lottery success or the great tragedy. I mean, there are a lot of complications there. It's overly simplistic. Chronic uncontrollable stress, for example, can depress hedonic set points. But for evolutionary reasons, uh, each of us has an approximate hedonic set point around which we tend to fluctuate in the course of a lifetime. Some people by Darwinian standards are pretty lucky. They are temperamentally optimistic. I mean, the fancy term is hypothymic. They're not clinically manic, but they just have a naturally high 
hedonic set points. They bounce back from setbacks. Uh, sure, some days are better than others. Some friendships, relationships are better, better than others. But essentially, they tremendous zest for life, life-loving optimists. They spend the overwhelming bulk of their life well above hedonic zero. Whereas sadly, as we know, there are hundreds of millions of people in the world who have a low hedonic set point who are clinically or subclinically depressed. And in certain circumstances, depression can be genetically adaptive. You know, depressive people, they keep their heads down. They don't annoy or offend uh, powerful people. They exhibit subordinate be be behavior. But yeah, essentially, evolution has just played with the hedonic tiles. Some people are pretty equable. They fluctuate only around a quite narrow range of emotions. Other people are more mercurial, in some cases, even, even, even bipolar. But yeah, the natural selection has given each of us this set of negative feedback mechanisms. There, there's quite a strong degree of genetic loading here. I mean, we knew this even before the rise of molecular biology from twin studies, concordant studies with monozygotic and di dizygotic twins. So yeah, it was a strong indication that there's a high degree of genetic loading. But molecular biology and neuroscience is starting to, to tease out the biological genetic basis. Now, I would stress, I most certainly am not discounting the role of the environment, that any approach to defeating the problem of suffering has to be twin track, uh, embracing economic, social, political, interpersonal reform. Yeah, the standard stuff, but the real twist, and this has been the focus of a lot of my work, is biohappiness revolution that if we are morally serious about first getting rid of the worst forms of suffering and then getting rid of suffering altogether we are going to have to tackle its biological genetic roots and this is now feasible with recognizable extensions of existing technologies this isn't speculation about the far future or what may be possible next century or next millennium. It's not invoking intelligence explosion or anything like that. These uh, are recognizable extensions of existing technologies. I mean, already, for example, all prospective parents could be offered access to pre-implantation genetic screening and counseling, and you could choose everything from the approximate hedonic range, hedonic set points to the approximate pain sensitivity of your future children. Within a, a decade or so, it's going to be possible for existing people to take advantage of gene therapy. And if you've always envied someone who is temperamentally extremely happy, with a few genetic tweaks, it should be possible to actually alter your DNA or rather one or two particular genes to tweak them so that you could have a default level of well-being analogous to the happiest hypothymic people uh, today. Now, perhaps 10 years is, is, I should really say, more like 20 to 25 years because there's going to need to be Clinical trials, there are all manner of missteps, but essentially all of the technologies I discuss, yeah, these are existing technologies or, or their extension. I think just in, in terms of the science there and the, some of the terminology, I think it'd be good to bring it up to a high level for some terms for and, and then also down deeper, maybe to, to some of the, the deeper levels, like you, you said, because I, I think they're fascinating. Um, the first one is just the, maybe on the, the more straightforward stuff, monozygotic. Gothic and dizygotic is oh, uh, sorry. identical yeah. and non-identical twins, I yeah, presume. That's it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking back to my my studies. And then then you did touch on the the genetic uh, changes and alterations that are possible. So do we do we know like the name? Feel free to mention the name of genes or the, the signature of them or how, however best describe them and maybe you know what their impact is and, and how we might target them. 
Yeah, I mean, here's, here's, here's an example. The SCN9A gene is the so-called volume knob for pain. And that if you engineer a child with a, a knockout version of SCN9A, a non-functioning version of SCN9A, then the child will have congenital insensitivity to pain. And we're not yet ready for getting rid of pain entirely because we need to preserve the function of nociception. But the SCN9A gene has dozens and dozens of different variants associated with, with different levels of pain sensitivity. And it will be possible to choose benign versions of SCN9A for your future child. And if you've met the kind of person who says, oh, pain, it's just a useful signaling mechanism. No, I mean, they don't like pain, but they just find it useful and adaptive. Tragically, of course, that is extremely atypical. Most people uh, have much greater uh, pain sensitivity, much lower pain thresholds. But nonetheless, if we are prepared to essentially embark on a regime in which everyone with the aid of genetic counseling chooses benign, a benign version of SCN9A for their future children, we have essentially cracked the problem of physical pain and suffering. And I, I trust you and listeners right now are comfortable in not in pain. But when everyone is suffering, one can be severe suffering. It is just shocking how bad it can be. Yet if we are prepared to make a relatively simple, straightforward uh, 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 genetic intervention, one can stop the horrors of severe suffering and, and do so in, in, in a generation or two. Giving existing people benign versions of SCN9A, that's more complicated. But as I was just alluding to a few minutes ago, there are already ongoing trials of gene therapy for existing recognized, well-recognized genetic uh, disorders. One widely reported uh, the, the earlier this year, transthyretin amyloid dosis seems to be, yeah, uh, extremely promising. So without uh, invoking drugs and drugs abuse or anything like that, we can ratchet up people's pain thresholds. Now, I should probably, well, not probably, I simply should stress the potential pitfalls here. And one of the most obvious uh, pitfalls is that if one uh, has an extremely high pain threshold, one is more likely to take risks, whether in competitive physical sports or, or more generally. So, yeah, there are lots and lots of potential pitfalls that, that, that need to be discussed but surprisingly, you know, you might imagine that the, the, the happiest people leading pain free lives, they would be more reckless, so they would die sooner. Actually, it seems to be the opposite. It, ten it tends to be depressive, pain ridden people who, who die prematurely, whether through self neglect or, or other reasons. Whereas people who, who really love life, they're very keen to preserve it. So it's not simply a straightforward matter of, more happiness, more risk taking. Yeah, that's interesting. There's kind of, it's almost like there's a group group element to that, whereby if the entire group, the whole population of, let's say, whatever the population of, of the, the world is then, if everyone is moving in the same trajectory um, and everything is 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 improving at a nicely for everyone, it's a little bit like economic improvements, then that seems to lead to more positive outcomes than if there's a great inequality where one group or a small number of people are, are getting much wealthier much more quickly and that that relative poverty or relative wealth seems to to cause the, the issue so i think the the point i'm getting maybe is if everyone is moving forward at a, at a an, in an equitable way it's much easier to imagine a, a good coordinating world like like ants than uh, a pocket of people who who want to burn the house down and because they're suffering you know if, every, if everyone's in a po more positive frame of mind it should it should scale out in a better it's, way it's than... not it's not zero sum in the way that so many uh, economic you know the, the standard socioeconomic improvements 
yeah, so many uh, aspects of environmental manipulation, environmental reform have winners and losers. Whereas if you're tackling hedonic uplift, I mean, whether we're considering physical pain or default psychological well-being, there are a lot losers in the way that, uh, yeah, well, obviously, uh, increasing taxation on the uh, the very rich. One hesitates really to speak in terms of the the language of losers because billionaires are extremely rich, but nonetheless, they you know the, the rich perceive themselves as having something taken away from them. Whereas enabling hedonic uplift for all doesn't involve, uh, yeah, the, the, the winners and losers. I mean, once again, there are there are many complications here. Who's going to pay for it? But I think these complications really are just that. They're not fundamental objections that, yeah, it's the very nature of any information-based technology that the price trends in extra to zero. This is why the publishing industry is, is so sort of upset at so many breaches of copyright on, on online and the fact that everyone or almost everyone can now access, you know, the, the, the same cultural, musical, literary, film resources as, 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 as Bill Gates. I mean, this is, this is fabulous. And the same is going to be true with access to biological genetic information that, you know, the price of genome sequencing is, 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 is collapsing. But of course, there will be countless missteps on the way. I suspect Darwinian life has some extremely nasty surprises still in, in store for us. But I think we, we need to be clear about the vision that essentially we should be aiming to phase out all forms of involuntary suffering. Uh, the involuntary is important. No one is going to force you to be happy or, or, or anything like that. But I think we need to be clear about it. I mean, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the World Health Organization. Got good, good health for all. It's, it's, it's not committing you to any particular scheme of normative ethics or metaethics or anything like that. It's not asking you to give up your existing values and preferences for the most part. Simply recalibrating the hedonic treadmill allows you to to value uh, the same things as you do now to keep your preference and everything from music to football to your taste in you know politics and so on in one sense yeah it's incredibly incredibly ambitious yeah the goal of abolishing suffering but if we don't have this as our goal then yeah what's yeah what what's the point of it all uh, the the traditional environmental, social, ec economic interventions on their own don't seem to, in a sense, have radically shifted hedonic set points since, uh, since the Stone Age. Uh, uh, on average today, the average person today is probably neither more nor less happy than our ancestors 6,000 years ago. And that is in spite of all the incredible efforts that have been put into social, political, economic reform. Yeah, I think that side of things is very interesting. I suppose it's good to call out that if we go back before anesthesia was invented, for example, I presume most people would have had to experience a bout of surgery that was very much, they were very much present for um, and weren't put under using an anesthesia. So just to clarify your point there, we're not saying that there wasn't moments of, ex of, of true pain and suffering and, and horror there. Oh, good heavens, no. But, but the average course of, of everyday life experience, particularly in terms of status, maybe, and, and you know, access to just everyday things, that the hedonic set point at that level, as, as people move through their day, is the same as on average. The hedonic set point as people move through their world today. Yes, yeah. As I said, there are lots of complications. I mean, losing a child, for example, for example, infant compare rates of infant mortality is traumatic, whatever your hedonic set point. But yeah, uh, essentially, there are limits to what can be done by environmental manipulation alone. That even if nationally we were to create the Garden of Eden, some people would still be depressed and angst-ridden if we don't 
tackle the hedonic treadmill and the biological genetic roots of suffering. And if I appear to come across sometimes, uh, particularly in conversation, as a crude genetic determinist, uh, uh, I'm not. But they tend to be neglected. I mean, particularly in the wake of, uh, of the horrors of eugenics in the 20th century, a lot of people will shy away from anything to do with genome reform. But yeah, if, if we're ethically uh, serious, we're, go- we're going to have to rewrite our corrupt genetic source code. Yeah, I think that, and I think the thing there is, look, there's a massive pot of ideas in existence available to all societies, and many ideas are taken on and taken on and used badly. And that does not mean that th- that the ideas should always be used badly. There is a potential still that exists within the idea to use the idea well. So it seems, I, I mean, I imagine that the best, some of the best ideas we have today have been tried out badly long before. <laughs> and we can, we can even trivialize it. We can take something like the iPhone. You know, before the iPhone, there was the Windows phone. And Windows back in the, I think it was in the early 2000s and that, um, had a you know their own their own ideas of, of how to go about doing that and it was a phone it, it, it was the same kind of idea it was mobile devices they were interested in all that nobody cared nobody wanted it and then 2007 which is not eons later <laughs> all of a sudden the iphone turns out to be the most probably transformative idea in in decades you know maybe since the internet itself um they're both mobile devices that deliver the internet and, and media experiences on it and, and informational experiences. How is one idea such a failure and the other idea such a culturally transformative thing for the planet? They're the same idea on paper at some level. The difference is, is the timing. The difference is, is the context. The difference is the way it's coming in. So the, I, it's a trivial example. I don't want to trivialize mobile phones compared to genetic engineering, but I, it seems strange to say that we would never try to improve things and that we would leave things to the whim of nature. Otherwise, why do we bother building houses? We should just let, let nature provide the caves. And well, if there's not enough, oh, well, you know. So it, it seems strange to, to not try and, and bring that within the fold of, of, of culture and societal progress carefully. Now, on the software analogy, I'm, I'm interested. I think, first of all, um, it might be good to bring in the distinction you mentioned already between between this ongoing permanent change to one's genetics from birth and also a therapy that can change one's genetics long after they have been born and, and are very much existing. Do you want to just mention those two things? I, I presume we're going to bring in germline versus CRISPR, is it? Essentially, Today, if you are psychologically distressed, some form of mental ill health, there are biological therapies, not genetic therapies, but yeah, it's essentially clinical drugs. And there are also non-biological approaches, cognitive behavioral therapy, meditation, a whole raft of counseling services. And sometimes, if all goes well, they offer symptomatic relief. And so, yeah, we need to distinguish between the short, medium and long term. But take antidepressant drugs, for example, hundreds of millions of people worldwide, clinically or subclinically depressed, Today's so-called antidepressants are pretty lame, and I suspect one of the reasons they are so lame is that they avoid targeting the neurotransmitter system most directly involved in hedonic tone, which is the mu opioid transmitter system. Now, we all know the horrendous pitfalls of using opioids, whether for treating physical or psychological pain. But yeah, is, if someone is, a, is administered a morphine, they will experience psychological relief and physical relief. And you know, imagine just trying to treat juvenile diabetes without using insulin. It is much harder tackling chronic uh, depression if one avoids the the opioid system which is why of existing antidepressants the you know the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors the old tricyclics monoamine oxidase inhibitors bupropion uh, and so on 
a small minority of people, they actually work extremely well. They get complete relief. A few even feel better than well. Very small. More people get some relief, but not full remission. Some people don't experience any relief at all, or existing antidepressants can even, in a minority, small minority of cases, make their d- d- depression worse, which is why it is so important not just to help existing people, but to avoid creating a new generation of depressives. And that is why I keep on harping so much about the case for using pre-implantation genetic screening and counselling and soon CRISPR uh, genome editing. That if, if anyone who decides they want to have children, there is a very significant likelihood that their child at some point will become depressed. I mean, a lot of people go through life without suffering clinical depression. Fantastic. But as I said, a very large minority of people are depressed. And if you simply pursue the normal genetic crapshoot of sexual reproduction, you are taking an appalling risk of having a child who will suffer a great deal. Of course, there are many forms of mental, physical ill health beyond uh, depression. But I think now we have an obligation to load the genetic dice. When we talk about just the technical things there, Something like pre-implantation and, and screening, just what, what, what form does that take? What, what's Essentially, the... there, there are different forms, but instead of just, you know, the, the normal traditional route of having sex and seeing what happens with a genetic experiment, if, let's say, a fertilized egg is removed and the zygote, its genome is sequenced, it can then be edited And a decision can then be taken whether to implant the zygote and then have a normal pregnancy. It's most commonly used pre-implantation genetic screening and counselling today to to prevent well-recognised genetic diseases like cystic fibrosis. If you know there is a high likelihood of passing on the aberrant gene to your offspring, in the West, it's quite common to use this technique. In India and China, pre-implantation genetic screening is generally done for the purposes of gender selection. However, pre-implantation genetic screening is not currently done for such things as pain sensitivity or approximate hedonic set point and hedonic range. And I hope that we're going to have a debate as a, a society. How much new suffering do we want to bring into the world? How much more joy do we want to bring in, in, into the world? I mean, it's not as straightforward as just, you know, a graphic equalizer or a single master volume knob. But nonetheless, increasingly, yeah, it is going to be feasible to choose the approximate, yeah, essentially default level of well-being or ill-being of your future children. I was going to ask, just as you brought it up, the, the volume of novels, SN uh, for, for pain. The SC. SN, uh, SC, sorry. SC. <laughs> I've, SCN, I've, not an gene, yes, yeah. I've pre-implanted the wrong, the wrong words. Yeah, <laughs> the conversation I was, yeah. there. <laughs> so the power of framing <laughs> continues. But I was wondering, just in, in conjunction with that, is as you said, you can't just adjust that um, arbitrarily, maybe without thinking about the effects on other expressed characteristics that, that will occur in the individual as a result of changing that. Do we have a sense today of, of the impact of changing that gene and you know or, or, or maybe there's more than one that we would target there on, on the other characteristics i mean i could mention a couple of other genes too i mean the scn9a it is especially physical pain but inevitably it will have your particular allele will have a spectrum of behavioral and psychological effects too i would be very interested in systematic research into the psychological attributes of people with different versions of SCN9A. Sadly, some people have versions which give people a much greater susceptibility to pain, much lower pain thresholds, even kind of so-called man on fire uh, uh, syndrome. So it's simplistic simply talking about physical pain and psychological pain. 
But here's another example of what can be done to help both existing people and future humans. The far and far out genes. A couple of years ago, she was in the news, Jo Cameron, this re retired vegan Scottish school teacher. Jo thinks that, or she thought that she was completely normal, but essentially she has an exceptionally high pain threshold. She is never anxious, never depressed. Uh, apparently childbirth felt like a tickle. Essentially, she comes pretty close to the world. I won't say that she's completely beats it, but she comes pretty close to the World Health Organization definition of health. I and mean, she came to the attention, finally came to the uh, attention of medical authorities when she waved away painkillers for something that would normally be, I think it was a trapeziectomy, or, that would normally be excruciatingly painful. And she just sort of waved away painkillers, even just even an analgesics for, for, for something so painful. And anyway, the research was done and it transpires. She has two unusual genetic mutations to her FAR and her newly christened FAR out genes. And they modulate levels of anandamide in the brain. Anandamide from the Sanskrit for bliss is essentially an endogenous cannabinoid. A single version of this benign version of the FAR gene confers pretty high hedonic set points, low anxiety, optimism, good quality of life. But Joe's unique dual version means that she is mildly euphoric most of the time. And she still responds in an adaptive way to the good things and bad things in life. But essentially, she is extremely hypothymic. She's not in some ways ideal for what we're talking about because her pain threshold is so high that sometimes she would only notice that she uh, sustained tissue damage yeah, after this was pointed out to her. But essentially, yeah, she has, got, she has gone through life thinking she is, is completely normal. I think we need to do controlled clinical trials of babies with one version or two versions of the far and far out genes, seeing what quality of life and what spectrum of behavior that babies who exhibit this constellation of traits enjoy. I mean, because there are obvious risks, but there are obvious advantages in terms of quality of life too. Now, Notice so far, I haven't been talking at all about the more ambitious transhumanist stuff of life based on radiance of superhuman bliss or anything like that. It's going to be technically feasible, but right now we're focused on today's genetic hedonic outlier. People like Joe and given her temperament, I mean, some, some people wouldn't want their lives and names blasted everywhere in the pub, public domain, but possibly for reasons of her temperament. She's been very relaxed about it. She was appearing on TV quite a, a lot a couple of years ago. Yeah, she is the kind of case study of what is possible with existing genome. Today is ge genetic outliers. Uh, there are other examples one could give to the so-called COMP gene, catecholomethyltransferase. There's two variants, one associated with a relatively high, another low hedonic set point, what version do you want for your future children? Or do you prefer just the traditional genetic crapshoot? But I think prospective parents really do have a responsibility here. I mean, I'm personally a, a soft antinatalist. I'm not really convinced that one is morally entitled to bring any more suffering into the world. But if, like most people, you think uh, that it's good to create babies, then let's create happy babies. Or do, is there is there an effort to identify other people with this this gene and then sort of do a I don't know what you call it a meta analysis on top of you know it's not controlled but we can we can start to look at what is the effect of this at large. 
Yes, only, only apparently only one per other person has been discovered with Joe's unique dual mutation. Until uh, Joe uh, was investigated, this role of the far out gene was not understood. It was thought assumed it was a, a, a pseudo gene. But yeah, essentially anyone can have their genome sequenced. I mean, the price has 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 collapsed. What was known beforehand was that said the single version of the mutation was associated with unusual well-being, optimism, reduced susceptibility to anxiety, depression, higher higher pain thresholds. Yes, I mean we kind of researchers are crunching the numbers. For obvious reasons, there are problems with doing well-controlled experiments. You know, they take a very long time uh, with humans, but this isn't a complete leap into the unknown. <laughs> it seems like we want to be conferring a positive trait there, knowing it, uh, certainly if we knew from analysing people existing through, through the genetic lottery, as you say, that, that exist with those versions of the gene, and we can see that they very much broadly lead, you know, more optimistic, more positive lives. Maybe we find out what if there are any pitfalls or what the trade offs are there for those people. Being armed with that information w- would obviously make it easier to to make a case for more controlled intervention, more controlled experimentation. If we knew that all outcomes in all arms of the experiment are either uh, exactly what, what it is now, which would be the control versus what is almost certainly a more positive life and then the choice becomes the ethical choice in that at time of experimentation is is becomes one of what is in quotes natural versus not natural yeah and and maybe the historic context of of how things have gone before when ideas have been used badly it would seem that there's just it's kind of like there are absolutely no downsides <laughs> it's one of those oh. kind of um, advertisements <laughs> but that's not quite true. <laughs> I, one of the one one thing that is absolutely critical, I think, is to uphold in law the sanctity of life. Now, that makes one sound vaguely religious. I'm not religious, but nonetheless, if the history of the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century eugenics movement has taught us anything, yeah, it's just that humans cannot be trusted. Uh, so I personally think that the sanctity of human and non-human animal life ought to be enshrined enshrined in law. I mean, there, OK, there are complications, you know, something like a, a zygote. If you're a Catholic, you think ensoulment takes place at the moment of, of concept. I mean, it's not as though sort of all zygotes are sacred or, any, or, or anything like that. But nonetheless, I think this is critical ethically. Yeah, that, that, That's a, a fundamental ethical pillar that however we define life the moment of life the moment of beginning whether it's maybe for some people as you said it's the the, the, the zygote level maybe other other people other ideas would point towards oh it's at the time where there is a given level of of experience a you know um a kind of an experiential quality i'm dodging the abortion debates uh here too i mean there, there, there are yeah the, the, there are complications obviously uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll not I'll, I'll not look to bring you into any debates <laughs> as we've we've gone through plenty of material already. So I think uh, it's more just <laughs> it's more just to, to footnote that. But what can be agreed is that wherever wherever one puts the point of existence thereafter, um, we, we do treat people as an end in themselves, not as a, as a means. People cannot be treated as resources, even though we, we commonly do, in, even in terminology in this day and age. But there has to be something ethically going forward where in hand with everything you're saying there is a true commitment a real laser-like focus on improving the well-being of individuals and by extension society yes i mean there's there's clearly a tension between if one is a negative utilitarian which i am negative utilitarian someone who thinks that overriding obligation is to minimize and mitigate ideally abolish suffering a negative utilitarian talking about the sanctity of life there might seem to be a a tension here but uh, the tension is deceptive i think a society in which uh, life is devalued is likely to lead to worse consequences as the 20th century eugenics movement bore out uh worst place 
planning scenarios, thinking of all the different ways things can go wrong and more. However, in spite of this, you know, planning for doom, gloom, disaster, all the things that can go wrong, I think we also need to plan what could conceivably go right too, and that is a world without suffering. That does sound like a a good world to to linger on. I I think that we're probably coming up around the hour mark now, so it might be a good time to close out this as maybe end of part one. (laughs) I think it wraps up nicely, uh, you know, a lot of what we we talked about in terms of of biohappiness. Is there there anything else just what we've excluded is, is, you know, conversations around transhumanism, that more on the front foot approach of the bliss side in, in, in the future and the really strong positive steps we can make forward there. We touched on that in the introduction, but maybe we'll leave that for a separate section. Is there anything you want to say about really on, on what we've covered? It's around just those steps towards reducing suffering. Is there anything maybe that we've we've missed or are there any closing thoughts? It's essentially, yeah, close, closing thoughts for this, this section. Number one priority, getting the death factories shut and outlawed. Factory farming, slaughterhouses are abomination. We, we can't talk about systematically helping sentient beings until we, until we stop systematically harming them. And realistically, the death factories are going to close when the cultured meat and animal products revolution matures. I think we should have perhaps something like a a referendum on closing slaughterhouses by the year, let's say 2030, which gives a tremendous commercial imperative for companies to develop and commercialize cultured meat products. Clearly, I would strenuously urge everyone now to go vegetarian and ideally vegan who isn't already, but that is a critical part of the abolitionist project that essentially a pig is as sentient as a small child and should be treated accordingly. In terms of humans, as I said, the strategy embraces pre-implantation genetic screening, counselling, CRISPR genome editing for future children, and within the next few decades, gene editing for existing people. The final leg of the abolitionist project, which we haven't touched on and we perhaps won't go into detail now is yeah essentially reprogramming the rest of nature the problem of suffering is fixable in nature everything from fertility regulation immunocontraception tunable gene drives reprogramming predators needless to say this is this this really is well it probably strikes a lot of people as science fiction but before actually doing this One can actually do pilot studies, self-contained artificial biospheres, all of the biological genetic stuff that we've touched on for people can be done with humans too. And yeah, essentially it is going to be possible to create a biosphere without suffering. If the political will and consensus existed, it could be done in a hundred years or so. This is not a prediction. I fear hundreds of years of pain and suffering lie ahead. But yeah, if some version of the transhumanist project comes to pass, yeah, it's going to be possible to have a triple S civilization of, of, of super intelligent life animated by gradients of intelligent bliss. And I think that's a goal worth striving for. Along with trans transhumanism, um, I think what you've what you've mentioned, animal suffering and uh, you know, noting it there is it's probably our best bang for buck. Um, if we want to reduce suffering, that would be the place to go. I, I, I think that's something we can we'll definitely talk about again and give its own you know, section properly, give it its own time and space. And um, I think one of the things we, we, we discussed was just you mentioned it, but I think it's worth calling it out again, the voluntary versus involuntary aspect of suffering that when we talked about dialing down pain and boosting you know, one's well-being via that mechanism, you were very, you were clear, but I'll say it again, that it's a, it's a voluntary choice, not involuntary. And I think things like maybe certain things in sports, certain things we get in terms of the, the good feeling from experiencing a challenge and overcoming it. And maybe another great example is, is things like art, where much art is created maybe through the, the darker moments. I think the first thing is the suffering you're talking about eliminating is the involuntary suffering, just to underscore that. And if one chooses 
the voluntary side of the equation, well, you know, there, there, there's certainly reasons that people may want to do that. Well, is there anything to disagree there? Because I didn't want I didn't want to drag you back into it too much. Oh well, no, no, no. I was just, yeah. It's essentially, I tentatively predict that we are going to get rid of all forms of suffering, any experience below hedonic zero. But that prediction is different from the advocacy, which is stressing getting rid of all forms of involuntary suffering. You, yeah, you mentioned great art and how much of existing works of art has been born out of, of great suffering. Yeah, I personally think that it's going to be possible to create, for example, superhuman beauty by identifying the molecular signatures of aesthetic experience and purifying and amplifying them. So rather than some kind of aesthetic wasteland in future, if everyone is happy, it's quite possible that, yeah, everyday life will be superhumanly beautiful. But once again, as you rightly uh, said, it is really important to stress the, the voluntary nature of this, that a surprising number of people seem to think if you discuss biohappiness revolution, that someone somewhere is conspiring to make them happy. I don't know whether it's brave new worlds. I, I don't know quite the reason. There is a complication. The big complication is that what about future children? Should their default settings be as today, a predisposition to suffer with the option at the age of 18 that they can tweak their genomes and enjoy life based on gradients of bliss? Or should the default setting be genetically pre-programmed well-being with the notional right at the age of 18 to be able to create pain, misery, suffering, yeah, all the rest of it, which is pretty fanciful. Yeah, when you, when you when you offer those two options, the second one does sound interesting to say the least. I think with with some of these things, we did mention locking in, let's say, the lower pain path and the happy path when someone is is already born versus versus before being born. There's a couple of things I want to talk about a software analogy. There, there's a, I'm going to bring in the word rollback, and maybe we'll finish out the conversation on that. But first of all, my understanding is that if we were to make let's call them permanent changes to uh, someone's genetic makeup. We edit the gene. It's a germline edit germ being an interesting word for people that aren't familiar with this terminology in science, but it really means at the most fundamental level, uh, you know, zygotic earlier, all that kind of thing, that, that that is where the alteration is made. And then when those children, if they were to go on to have children naturally, then they would also confer on those changes. Yes, it's uh, just just one qualification there, though it's sometimes said that tweaks to existing people are temporary, whereas germline editing is permanent. There is nothing to stop future editing or even reversing the changes for future generations. But in practice, once one has got rid of some of our nastier code, we're not going to bring it back. But yeah, in theory, this is all reversible. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah. Absolutely. No, that, 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 that was it. And it, it, it led nicely into the rollback. So I suppose in software, if there might be uh, one, one or two software people listening to this editing code, though not in any germlines. <laughs> um, but people in software would often be familiar with this concept of when you make changes to a system, let's say you're ro rolling out a new version of a service, a software service, maybe, whether it be something like Facebook or something like Amazon, or it could be even the, the revenues website that often people push out changes and then they monitor and see how those changes are going. And should those changes be problematic, then there is the facility to roll back to the previous version. And I suppose I'm just really calling out that is something possible in everything you're saying. Yes, I, but I mean, just as there are, I don't know precisely what the latest tally is, the cystic fibrosis gene, well over a thousand different uh, mutant alleles have uh, been discussed in associated, associated with cystic fibrosis. When we get rid of cystic fibrosis, and we will, we're not going to be bringing them back. So loosely one can speak with germline editing, this is, this is permanent changes. But yeah, you know, we're not going to lose the knowledge, the, the theoretical possibility of, of restoring stuff will exist too. Yeah, I think my thinking there is more if we make a change and we, we don't know everything in advance, it's really to, Ali, 
some people's concerns where they feel like, oh, well, you would have been better off with the, in air quotes, natural version of the gene, which natural is absolutely the wrong word there, given that if, if we wanted a natural life, we would naturally live in caves, but we don't. We, we, we tend to book the natural trend. But in that example where people may be concerned that the engineered version um, but led to unforeseen problems, let's say at a certain scale in a group, it turns out that that change, this is completely a thought experiment, in fact, wasn't advantageous for, for individuals in our society. So we say, OK, we, we should probably dial down or roll back to a previous version. And that's really the Yeah, I think, this, I think this is what also needs to be stressed is that having children is a genetic experiment, a reckless, untested genetic experiment that is going to cause a great deal of suffering. As I said, I'm I'm not arguing for case the case for strong anti natalism or anything like that. I don't think it is sociologically realistic. There will always be strong selection pressure against it. But it isn't a case of the the safe thing to do and the unsafe genetic experimentation that I've been proposing in our discussion. It's of uh, of what kind of experimentation to do. But yet there will be tragedies, mistakes, missteps, unanticipated stuff, you name it. Sooner or later, if you have a low pain society, a kid has an accident and the mother screams, you know, imagine the headlines, evil scientists murdered my baby, that if he or she had had normal well, traditional pain thresholds might not have done the reckless thing and would still be alive today. So though I've a lot of this podcast, I might seem to have been singing a happy tune of future of superhuman bliss, a world of, of, you know, there will be innumerable things that go wrong. This is this is sad, tragic, unavoidable. And we should do everything within our powers to, to minimize, mitigate the tragedies and the common or garden uh, low key mini disasters. But we really do need to have a vision of, of the long term future, because if, if we don't tackle the biological genetic roots of suffering, a thousand years from now, our descendants will be saying, well, look, we have this fabulous technological civilization. Why aren't we happy? And the, the deafening silence to answer it. Um, I suppose just on your point there on the, the headline case of the, the child that tragically something would happen to. I suppose there's two things there. Maybe is a useful analogy to something like the driverless car at the moment, whereby there will, of course, be some situations where on the way things go wrong, but that we ultimately know that once we have a full grid of smart cars enabled, that they will all be able to intelligently network and talk to each other and they will be able to avoid hazards with each other. And we probably will end up in a world of smart objects where the buildings will somehow be codified you know, even more, I suppose we already have GPS and things, but there may even be more smarts on top of that, whereby all physical objects can broadly can just avoid each other. Uh, and certainly, certainly for cases in cars on well-designed roads and, and networks. Is it a similar analogy there in the genetic engineering space that you're talking about that, you know, once we focus on the overall picture? Yes, I mean, known biases can be corrected for, unlike ignorance. And something like depressive realism, this is the fact that people who have low mood, not severe, not ultra low depressive suicidal, but people who have low mood, their judgment in many contexts can actually be superior by various quasi objective indices to those of people who are non depressed, certainly people who are op optimistic. But given we know uh, the fact that temperamentally happy people see the world through rose-tinted spectacles, this can to some extent be corrected for. And if we know we're going to be living in a society in which most people have, by today's standards, extremely high pain thresholds and are extremely hypothymic, temperamentally optimistic, if we're smart, we can intelligent, we can correct for this. What one can't correct for is the unknown unknowns. But to the best of our knowledge, there is no technical reason 
why we can't eliminate experience below hedonic zero and not in the sense of wireheading, getting people's uh, reward circuitry uh, wired up, so uniform imbecilic bliss, but in the sense of an architecture of mind based on information sensitive gradients of well-being. There's probably something as well whereby, and it's the, the, the second point that I wanted to close with was, there may be certain things where the information sensitivity at the moment, for example, don't put your hand on a burning stove. At the moment, we have a physiological reaction to that that tells us, take your hand off the stove very, very quickly. Maybe some things in the world, we will just need to, rather than empirically having to react to them, in other words, off the sensory world, they will be things that will be taught to us rationally. So in fact, maybe in the same way as we are very focused on ensuring kids do not play beside a main road, so too maybe all adults will be educated not to put their hands on, on hot stoves. Now, there won't be adults being educated, it'll be the population all along, but there may be certain things, I suppose I'm saying, that, that w- w- we have to suffer first, then react to. But in future, we may just put in safeguards so those things don't happen. And that may be through education or that may be through, through you know, physical, physical design of systems to stop, us, to stop us doing certain things. Or, as you say, finding the correct information sensitivity level for this, these pain, pain thresholds and things like that. Yeah, there, as you say, many options and something like pain. I mean, one option doesn't rely on information sensitive gradients at all, but just involves... Uh, neuroprostheses sensors so that yeah your hand is automatically withdrawn from the hot uh, the hot stove owing to this implanted device with a manual override so you don't feel you've lost control of your body the alternative is to redesign the environment we've talked a lot about pain and depression less so about anxiety and on the african savannah the uh, the mother who was extraordinarily anxious, endlessly seeing lions, catastrophizing, constantly worrying, worrying, worrying about her offspring. She was more likely to, other things being equal, pass on copies of her genes than the happy mother who trusted God that all was going to be right in the end kind of thing. One needs to look at each of our core emotions, ranging from jealousy to anxiety, happiness, anger, and ask, What is its typical functional role? Do we want to preserve the functional role? And do we want to preserve the raw feels? And there are some basic emotions that I think we could probably scrap the functional role and the raw feels, such as jealousy. Others, something like anxiety, we need to preserve the functional role. What we want to do is get rid of the raw, nasty raw feels. You can see I'm struggling to um, to stop talking <laughs> on, on these topics that every time I say I'm nearly getting at the end, it's it's like one of those loading bars in uh, in operating systems um, about 10 years ago where <laughs> you're copying a file and it's nearly there and we stay permanently stuck at 99 percent. But I did want to ask you about jealousy that you, you brought it up. Could that be seen as something of a transitional, let's say, emotion in that? Currently, jealousy serves, let's say, one example is an evolutionary function to keep perhaps family units together, that if someone is jealous, and of course, of course, actually, it should also be said, and perhaps even more so, of breaking family units apart. So it's, it's, you know, it serves the boat roles. But let's just say where jealousy does focus one on keeping the unit together, maybe, maybe a, a man sees someone else talking to their wife and uh, flirting with them and that man then maybe he's not been the best husband for maybe a week or you know maybe maybe longer who knows and um, probably he could probably be jealous of her reactions to that that jealousy could then motivate him Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be the Shakespearean take out the dagger and remove the competition it may it may be something as much as as the desire to to actually be a better husband in that case. And then maybe he, he may take on that advice to himself to do, uh, to be nicer, you know, improve, improve himself that way. Is there a thing whereby jealousy serves a role, maybe until everyone is in an environment where we, almost like ants, we can move forward in good faith in relation to each other as individuals within a societal framework? Because to put it crudely, there is no bad out there to be jealous of or to, 
does that question make sense? Yeah, I mean, one can, it depends how much detail one wants to go into because recalibration by itself doesn't say anything about eliminating jealousy or at least the functional analogs of jealousy. And we could focus entirely on simply hedonic uplift. And so all, you know, the existing bad stuff in our society, jealousy, envy, competitiveness, you name it, could in theory persist indefinitely, but people's just default hedonic tone, default levels of well-being have been ratcheted up. However, we could be more ambitious and aim not just for hedonic uplift, but getting rid of something like jealousy. But the more specifics one goes into, the more likely one is to be wrong. I mean, one can see, for example, today on something like, you know, a drug like MDMA, which induces ecstasy, which induces the release, not just a lot of dopamine and serotonin, but also a lot of oxytocin too, that, yeah, you can see someone's, you know, snogging your girlfriend, boyfriend, or whatever, and be completely chilled about it. Everyone is, yeah, essentially blissful, (laughs) blissful in some cases, uh, blissed out. But Although personally, the idea of an MDMA-like society, you know, everyone loved up, hugging each other, it's appealing to me. Not everyone is attracted to this vision. And the abolitionist project, Biohappiness Revolution, doesn't depend on specifics like that. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that, I think that's a great closing kind of, I think that that is where we hit the 100% bar on the one or two, le- one or two uh, loose ends, but uh, yes, if there's... <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they shall always exist. Well, well, certainly um, this conversation uh, is something that I've, I've, I've definitely wanted to start, um, you know, for quite, quite a long time. So it certainly has been um, quite, a, quite a Christmas present to, to have this conversation with you today, David. So thank you very much. We have a lot more to talk about, but certainly in what we've talked to date, thank you very much for your time and, and generosity today and much appreciated. Thank you, Declan. Well, that concludes today's episode, and I really hope you enjoyed this introduction to David's abolitionist project ideas as much as I did. I also hope your hedonic set point is very much near the top end of the range after that conversation. If you want to follow more about David's work, he can be found as at Webmaster Dave on Twitter. And he elaborates on a lot of his ideas on the Quora platform, so we have a link to his profile there in the show notes. David's original manifesto, The Hedonic Imperative, is available at headweb.com. That's H-E-D-W-E-B dot com. So that's head as in hedonic, not as in the box you carry your brain around in. Just one clarification relating to today's discussion. I mentioned Microsoft failing with their Windows Phone prior to the release of the iPhone. It's worth noting that the officially branded Windows Phone was released after the iPhone, but as you can see from the nifty Windows Phone timeline that we've added to the show notes, Microsoft was very much in the game long before that. So all that's left to say is thank you for listening. Do hit the subscribe button on your podcast player if you'd like to do this again sometime. And five-star reviews of the show are more precious than a Bitcoin at the moment. So if you'd like to leave a review on iTunes, then that would be greatly appreciated. It really is a massive help for conversations like today's reaching a wider audience. Until next time, stay philosophical. Mm-hmm.